So uh, welcome everyone. It's uh, really a great pleasure to be here. I had a chance to be in the previous conference three years ago, and I'm all, always delighted to be back to uh, Toronto. Uh, so, you know, as the week goes by, the lunch break keeps getting, <laughs> you know, longer and longer. So, you know, I had to run back uh, for the talk. But uh, yes, yeah, so I'm excited to present these results. It's actually the first time I give this talk. Uh, and it is about uh, the ultimate physical limits to operator growth. Yeah? So I'm going to introduce what, what do I mean by operator complexity and you know, what kind of limits we have put in, in them. Before doing that, I want to introduce the group. So we moved to uh, Luxembourg a couple of, uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago. And uh, there's a small research group. So there's a postdoc and three PhD students, uh, a bachelor student and a master student. So the work I'm going to present has been done by uh, the master student and the two PhD students. I work closely with a group of Aurelia Chenou in the same university, and we exchange some some group members. So now Niklas is is working with her to uh, in her in his PhD studies. <coughs> so uh, for those who don't know me, so you know I broadly work on on non-equilibrium phenomena. Uh, I have been very interested in quantum control techniques now a shortcut to adiabaticity, dynamics of phase transitions, and with this kind of uh, ideas, oftentimes we find connections to either, uh, you know, uh, quantum annealing, quantum computing, uh, uh, information geometry, parameter estimation. So we have several talks on quantum metrology, and also a variety of, you know, more quantum uh, stat phase problems on quantum chaos and integrable systems. But today I'm going to focus on uh, this idea of uh, operator complexity. So I will start uh, providing my intuition, so how I got interested into the uh, problem. And this is uh, through uh, the use of uncertainty relations, time energy uncertainty relations, and the refinement of these concepts that has been done in the last decades using so-called quantum speed limits. And with that, I will introduce the problem of Krilov complexity. I will revise a hypothesis, which is out there uh, in the literature. And then we will come with our key results, which is a rigorous bound for operator growth. And the, maybe even more interesting, which are the conditions to saturate this, this bound. Uh, right, so there's a beautiful history of time in quantum mechanics, and in particular of time, energy, and certainty relations that goes back to the early days with Landau, Krilov, and so on. Uh, perhaps the first rigorous result is that by Mandelstam and Tam, uh, it's a textbook result uh, they derive the time energy uncertainty relation as we know it. And uh, they actually went further and predict an orthogonalization time for a quantum state evolving under unitary dynamics in terms of the inverse energy fluctuations. So over the last uh, you know, following decades, so this, this work was, uh, you know, the, the results were refined. And uh, in 98, uh, my friend Norm Margolus with Lev Levitin introduced a similar bound in terms of uh, the mean energy about the ground state instead of the energy fluctuations. And you may know that these bounds you know, have become very popular because uh, it was, you know, essentially it was suggested that they set a limit also in the computational uh, capability of physical devices that have been applied to quantum metrology, uh, generalized in, in several ways. Yes. So I started to work on quantum speed limits around 2013 when I extended to open systems uh, together with a group of uh, Luis Davidovich, we were Kind of we didn't know about each other, but we did at the, at the same time. Then we extended to the coherence times, so uh, focusing spe specifically on the decay of coherences. And we finally saw that there are also classical counterparts. So many of the quantum features of these speed limits were demystified by introducing these uh, classical analogs. <coughs> so you know, just a, you know how the how the main results go back in the you know, few few decades back. So, you know, the work of Mandelstam and Tam uh, just used the Heisenberg equ equation of motion and introduce a characteristic time scale. So the time scale, they look at the mean value of an observable and they ask, uh, in, you know, what's the, the time in which uh, the mean value changes by a magnitude of the order of the dispersion of that observable of the fluctuations. And in such a way, they conclude this very simple time energy uncertainty relation, which is a textbook result. You can find the English translation of the uh, old paper, and you will see that they also consider what happens if the observable is a projector, and actually it's a projector onto the initial state of the system. Uh, and then they introduce this notion that of, of the, you know, what's the minimum time for a state to become orthogonal to itself under time evolution. So that was the famous kind of the first speed limit in the literature that I know of. 
Uh, the work by Marco and Levitin is, is slightly different. So they introduce the survival amplitude of a, a, a pure state, and they impose that it vanishes both real and imaginary part. And in such a way, they go to some trigonometric uh, inequalities. Uh, this idea that the orthogonalization time is also bounded by the inverse of the mean energy. <coughs> uh, these time energy uncertainty relations have been uh, refined as I advance. And they are no longer formulated in these terms. So typically, we think of a, a quantum state, which is evolving. And we introduce a notion of distance, which does not need to be that for orthogonalization. It can be more uh, relaxed. So you, we introduce the, no, the notion of partial distinguishability. And I put this picture here that my uh, father-in-law took. And that it reminds me of the landmark blocks that uh, some of the experiments in Toronto are able to implement to some extent. So, you know, so we would like to have a, a clock uh, attached to our quantum state and that it tells us, you know, once uh, the state has evolved or traversed a given distance, uh, you know, what's the time that has elapsed. Uh, so, you know, how do speed limits look today? So we introduce something like making use of the fidelity. We are able to define a proper distance between states. So let's say this is, you know, the Bure's angle. Um, and, you know, it's just the arc cosine of the square root of the fidelity. And using standard uh, results, you know, you can upper bound it in terms of uh, the quantum fissure information, which is related to the uh, geometric quantum tensor that appeared in some talks before. And for unitary dynamics, these are just the energy fluctuations. So, you know, you see that the, speed, the, the distance traverse is uh, upper bounded by the integral over the speed of, the, uh, of evolution. So, so you can think of uh, energy variance or energy dispersion rather as a bound to the speed of evolution. Right, so, in, you know, with a notion of distance, L, the Bure's angle, and a notion of speed, delta H, you, you get this speed limit, right? And you can imagine that these are such basic elementary results in quantum dynamics that have found many, many fold applications. So, well, you know, they refine uh, time energy uncertainty relation, as I say, uh, but let's, let's discuss some of the applications, yes? So one that I mentioned is uh, computing. So, you know, there's estimates on what's the computational capability of a physical device or even of the universe, uh, as I was playing these games. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of the, of the quantum speed limits. So there's a minimum time that it takes you to implement a logic gate. And, you know, if you want to implement many, so again, you can use quantum speed limits and uh, use the energy uh, of the system or the energy fluctuations as a resource to limit uh, the computational uh, power of the physical device. We have had several talks on quantum metrology, and uh, I guess it was introduced that you, there you want to uh, uh, estimate a given parameter, x alpha, and there is a framework to bound the error in this estimation in terms of the quantum physical information. Well, it so happens that when you look at a physical system with a physical Hamiltonian and a physical bath, then the same time scales that are predicted by the quantum speed limits so uh, show up in the, uh, in the calculation and they govern the quantum physical information. So ultimately, uh, quantum speed limits govern the parameter estimation in, in uh, in quantum metrology. So this goes back to the works of Giovannetti and you know, with this also some, some works in that direction. Another topic where quantum speed limits have become fairly popular is in the context of quantum thermodynamics. Uh, we predicted in, uh, put forward in 2014, the idea that if you have a thermal machine, uh, quantum speed limits that limit the uh, rate at which you can run a cycle uh, will set up an upper bound into the uh, power of the thermal device. And you know, these results have been generalized by many groups. So I cite there uh, some, you know, Vina Abba, Eric Lutz, uh, Patti, uh, you know, Giovannetti, Niedensu, and many others. The same idea has been applied to quantum batteries, you know, to that store energy, how fast you can charge them, or more broadly to uh, quantum resources and uh, thermodynamic quantities. So there's work by Imar Marian, early, early work, connecting quantum speed limits to quantum resources. And uh, many other works showing how uh, uh, entropies, uh, heat, work, exchange are up constrained by speed limits. So, you know, this is just a summary saying that quantum speed limits have had many fold applications. Uh, These other topics are quantum control and many others. Okay, so let me now move to the idea of uh, operator complexity, and uh, we will revise and make use of something similar to a speed limit in that context. So, okay, I have now to introduce a bit the framework. So it's going to be very simple. It's just going to be unitary dynamics with a time independent Hamiltonian. Yeah? 
we can ask about generalizations. But, you know, so the idea is we look at an observable and it's just evolving in the high center picture. This is all very easy. And we know how, you know, what kind of time dependence it has. It is described by the conjugation of the my initial operator by the time evolution operator. In the Heisenberg picture, it turns out to be convenient to introduce the Liouvillian, so it's just the commutator of the Hamiltonian with an, a given observable. And uh, when you do that, you see that uh, you can express uh, the time dependence of your operator in a formal power series where you have powers of the Liouvillian acting on your initial observable. And here is where the notion of operator growth comes. Imagine that your operator, initial operator O, is a one-body operator, and that your Hamiltonian has, say, one-body and two-body interactions. Now, you are going to have all these nested commutators that crop up during the dynamics and become more and more relevant and time, as time uh, goes by. Yeah, so this is captures the idea of uh, some, some level of complexity there. You uh, end up having strings of operators uh, that increase in size. So if you have you know, the nth power and your Hamiltonian is scale local, approximately the uh, nth power of the Liouvillian will be like n times uh, nk local. So you end up, you know, through this uh, formal uh, power series, um, you end up generating all these all these powers, you know, a Liouvillian nth power acting on the operator, and uh, you may, you know, these these operators are not orthogonal, and you may wonder where is an efficient description? What's the smallest subspace where all these operator all, all these operators live? Yeah. So that's the so-called Krylov space. Yeah. So this is. Uh, has been around for, for a long time. It is used in many uh, numerical techniques uh, that go by Krylov subspace methods. And they aim at finding an efficient minimal description of the dynamics, a compact description. Good. So I want to emphasize that this space is a vector space, and this will allow us to, to introduce fundamental bounds in the dynamics. Yes? So we, I just going to change the notation a bit. So every time I have an observable A, I, I use a curly bracket uh, uh, to, to I suggest that I should think of it as a vector. And now I can pick up an inner product and I have freedom in the choice. So I can just took a trace, say, dagger B, like Hilbert Smith, or I can look for other uh, inner products which are a bit suggested by uh, condensed matter like thermal correlation functions and so on. The importance is that once I have an inner product, I also can compute the norm of an operator. So it will be just the square root of the inner product between uh, the operator and itself. And now there's a standard way of creating a basis. Yeah? So I have a vector space, and I want to introduce a basis. You know, this is kind of an elementary linear algebra just apply in this context. Yes? So I have my initial operator O, and I normalize it, and I'm going to say that this is one of the basis elements. Now I act with the Liouvillian on my initial operator O. Yeah? Uh, so this is LO, and I sub subtract the component along my previous basis that I have found. So I, I, this is. I act with the Liouvillian on O, I subtract the component on O0, which is the essentially normalized initial operator, and whatever is left, uh, I'm going to normalize it, and that's the way I construct the second basis element. And I, I can uh, iterate this procedure, so I can do you know, act twice with the Liouvillian on the initial operator, subtract the first two components in the previous uh, basis, and so on. And in such a way, I can construct a basis to describe uh, efficiently uh, operators in three loop space. Now, this is the standard Ram Smith decomposition uh, or Ram Smith process, and it's known to be slow and also numerically unstable. Uh, so, uh, there are other variants, and one of the things you can do is uh, to use the Langchos uh, algorithm, which is going to play an uh, important role. So, the Langchos algorithm is very different, uh, very similar. You take the, uh, origin, you know, the initial uh, operator, you normalize it. Uh, the only thing I'm doing is I'm giving an, a name to this norm. So this is going to be, these BNs are going to be the Langchos coefficients. So the first one, B0, is just the norm of the initial operator. B1 is the norm of the Liouvillian acting on the initial operator. And once I have these two basis elements, I just use a similar recurrent uh, relation where I simply act with the Liouvillian on the previous basis element, and I subtract the component along ON minus 1. And I multiply there with a Langchos coefficient. It's another way of constructing the basis. It's known to be more, uh, more stable, and uh, is the one we will adopt. Whichever way you do it, at the end of the procedure, you know, we just in introduce a basis. So now we have an efficient basis in Krylov space, which is the smallest one. 
And what is interesting is that this uh, associated this algorithm uh, truncates at a uh, given Hilbert, uh, oh, sorry, Trilog dimension d. Yeah, so you I iterate the process, and at some point, it generally it truncates. Uh, it may be that uh, this uh, uh, dimension is infinite. We will uh, also consider that case. And yes, I just give a name to these uh, uh, Langtos coefficients, uh, which are positive the way they have been defined. Right. <clears throat> So what, what are some of the properties of this? You know, how can you do uh, an efficient description of the dynamics uh, in, the, in this Krilov basis? Uh, it is uh, known that the Liouvillian acquires a very simple form. It is a tri-diagonal matrix with the diagonal being zero. So this is uh, like what uh, Adam Harrow called yesterday, I think, hollow matrix. So you know, it's uh, just upper and lower diagonals are equal, a real positive, and you know, the diagonal is zero. And what is interesting is you, now if you act with the Liouvillian on one of the basis elements of the Krilov space, you get the, the basis element which is one level up and one level down. Yeah? So because of this, uh, it's analogous. You, know, you can think of the Liouvillian as the sum of a generalized raising and lowering operator. Yeah? So th this actually will be uh, very convenient, uh, thinking of the Liouvillian in this term. Now, the standard canonical evolution of an operator in the uh, Heisenberg picture, you can now expand it in the Krilov basis, and you know, whatever is this value, you call it, uh, is, this is going to be the operator amplitude, and you call it bar phi. And it turns out to be convenient to introduce a factor of phi, but this is just for, for details, so that the bar phi's, these amplitudes are real uh, and not complex. And you reduce the dynamics now of, of the, uh, operate, the Heisenberg dynamics. Now you, it, it boils down to compute the time evolution of these operator amplitudes, which are just the uh, overlaps of the operator, uh, time-dependent uh, time operator with the Krilov basis. And it turns out that these amplitudes have this simple equation. This is almost like a diffusion equation. It's one-dimensional, so you, you have a finite lattice with these sides, and you have kind of a classical particle hopping uh, either to, you know, to move in one index left, one index to the right, um, with some coefficients. And, and there you see that these are precisely the Langtos coefficients that determine this hopping. Yeah? So that's why they, they are relevant. In these, the Langtos coefficients are the only ones that know about the uh, Liouvillian, about the generator of the dynamics. They are the only ones that know about the, uh, the Hamiltonian of the system in the end. Good. So, <clears throat> Uh, one more slide, so this is uh, to connect with, say, experiments, so there are several exper experimentalists in the audience, or also people who are able to do exactly solvable models or numerical simulations, yes? So how can you, you know, an alternative way, uh, approach to uh, tackle the dynamics in Krilov space is uh, to start with the computation of the correlation function, which may be difficult, and uh, what is important is uh, that if you know the correlation function very accurately, you can find all moments of the Liouvillian uh, through this identity, yeah? the one in the middle. So you can compute uh, the nth power or two nth power of the Liouvillian in terms of derivatives of the uh, correlation function. Now, if you know these numbers, uh, there's an alternative way of determining the Krilov coefficients, which is just through these relations which are well known between uh, Langtos coefficients and powers of the Liouvillian. Yeah? So this is, you, you, you know, this is just some algebraic uh, equations that you can solve. And ultimately, the idea is that if you know the correlation function, you can determine the uh, moments of, of the Liouvillian. With that, you can solve uh, for the Langtos coefficients. And ultimately, you can propagate and find the uh, operator amplitudes in the Krilov basis. So that tells you a, an alternative way of describing dynamics in Krilov space. All right, so this is all known. I just want to mention that these techniques have been used in many body physics for uh, a few decades. Uh, this is an interesting reference summarizing the literature there, so-called recursion method, and it has proved useful in the simulation of uh, many body uh, systems thanks to the fact that it provides an efficient uh, description of the, of the dynamics, a relatively compact description. It has also, uh, you know, this is a book pretty much focused on many body quantum physics, but you know, in the literature of applied math, uh, this goes by the name of Krilov subspace methods. Uh, right, so uh, let me skip this. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm going to think now of the, uh, you know, I, I, I can just uh, show this a bit. So, you know, the typical thing is I, I will look at uh, how the operator spreads in the Krilov basis as a function of time. And you can think almost like a wave packet, which is spreading in this lattice. 
and you may say, you know, what's the, its average location in the lattice, and you know, what's the dispersion, and so on. So uh, this is actually what is defined as the krill of complexity. The krill of complexity is simply what's the average position of the operator in the krill of lattice. Yeah? So we call an operator simple if it's at the beginning of the lattice. This is the initial local operator. And now as the time of evolution goes by, it spreads out in the krill of lattice and is having an overlap uh, in terms of higher nested uh, commutator, high order. So you know, overlap in, in the site n will say that there are nested commutators of, of order n involved in the representation of the operator. Uh, so this uh, was introduced by the group of Ild Alman in uh, Berkeley, and this is a, a nice work uh, that inspired much of the recent uh, literature and research in, in field of complexity. There's been a, a, quite a, a few works, uh, so you know, these are some that have inspired me, so you know, like uh, particular the works by Caputa, uh, Rabinovici, and so on. And what we have learned from all these uh, research is that the grill of complexity actually bounds a whole family of complexity measures, including out of time order correlators, operator size, and more broadly, a family called Q complexities, which I can uh, you know, discuss with you if you want. But, you know, so that, that essentially leverages the importance of grill of complexity because you know, it, it uh, essentially bounds many other complexity measures. Right. <clears throat> And uh, so, you know, the, the question arises as to how fast this grows in physical systems. And uh, the so-called universal operator growth hypothesis uh, was introduced in this paper by Parker. Uh, they essentially look at, uh, you know, they conjecture that the grid of complexity works at most, uh, uh, grows at most exponentially, and it does so in chaotic systems. And perhaps this is a, a new way of understanding quantum chaos. Uh, what they did exactly is to look at many uh, models that they could solve, physical models like uh, free fermions, interacting spin models uh, without and without disorder, some chaotic models uh, like Sakharov G, Kitayev model, and so on. And uh, they found a phenomenology where you either had a very slow growth of the Krilov coefficients, so you know, the, the, sorry, of the Langshaw's coefficients as a function of the in, uh, lattice index in the Krilov lattice. You see, for non-interacting systems, it's almost constant. For integrable systems, it grows like a square root of n or something like this. And for chaotic systems, it grows uh, linearly. And they conjecture this is the fastest it can grow. That it cannot grow like you know, like a parabola or something like this, or exponentially. Uh, right. And from there, you know, they actually found that if you have this linear dependence of the krill of, uh, of the Langshaw's coefficients on the lattice index then the grid of complexity grows exponentially with an analog of the Lyapunov exponent alpha. If there's any other kind of growth, it must be sublinear, and then the growth of the grid uh, of complexity is poly polynomial in time. Well, so with these results, they went ahead and they make the conjecture that physical systems at most have Langshaw's coefficients that grow linearly in time up to some constant value and perhaps some other corrections. And, and uh, you know, the, if you introduce an analog of the Lyapunov exponent just by taking the logarithmic derivative of the Krilov complexity, this is going to be upper bounded by alpha, and alpha is precisely the constant that determines the growth rate of the uh, Langshaw's coefficient in the uh, Krilov lattice. Uh, you know, it was suggested that perhaps uh, this is a way of, uh, you know, since the Krilov complexity also bounds the growth of the uh, out of time order correlators. Maybe this is a way of uh, rediving, generalizing the uh, celebrated uh, maldacena senker stanford bound, uh, in which the Lyapunov exponent has been upper bounded by essentially the temperature in a set of theories. Uh, right. <clears throat> Good. So, okay, here is where our results come. So, essentially, what we did is to uh, formalize the notion of operator uh, of operator growth of krill of complexity growth. And uh, it is actually extremely simple. What we, this is kind of elementary quantum mechanics, but just applied to this uh, setting of uh, of field of complexity and field of space. So we notice. Well, I mean, this this is also not noticed by us, but it was already uh, pointed out uh, that the field of complexity can be seen as the mean value or expectation value of an operator, which is just this operator, the field of complexity operator, uh, k tilde or k in a math call notation. Uh, which just is, you know, essentially a diagonal matrix in the Krilov basis uh, weighted with the uh, uh, index of the lattice. 
And if you look at its expectation value with respect to the time dependent operator, you just get the cradle of complexity. So I can think of a cradle of complexity operator. That's next. <clears throat> so, because we have seen that cradle of, is a, uh, cradle of a space is an inner product space, then you, we should be able to use a standard uncertainty relations, in particular Robertson uh, uncertainty relations. Now, for super, uh, super operators living in, in cradle of a space, rather than for standard operators in Hilbert space. Uh, so we'll, we'll have an identity of this form. So you know we will have this person of two super operators is uh, lower bounded by uh, the uh, absolute value of the expectation value of their uh, computator. And it turns out that if you choose a super operator, the Liouvillian and the grill of complexity operator, you do find a rigorous bound on uh, the growth of the grill of complexity. So you know you, we just use a standard uncertainty relations apply in grill of space. Uh, to the growth of the grid of complexity operator, and that way we can bound uh, rigorously the rate of uh, the grid of complexity in terms of its dispersion and the first Langchos coefficient. And this is the one that just knows about the Liouvillian acting on the initial operator, so it's a very simple one. It's the norm of L acting on O. Yeah. <coughs> Right, so, okay, so this, this is a bound, you know, I can massage the expression a bit and play the same kind of game that Mandelstam and Tam play uh, kind of a half a century ago and introduce a time scale, which is the time scale in which the grid of complexity uh, changes. Uh, you know, I look at its mean value, I look at its rate of change, and I say that it must change by uh, a magnitude of its, you know, comparable to its dispersion, and I call that a characteristic time scale, yeah? So with this game, I get this, uh, you know, this, this relation that the characteristic time scale for the grid of complexity to grow times the first Langchos coefficient is larger or equal than one half, and this is very analogous to the uh, time energy uncertainty relation with the obvious identification that where B1 plays the role of the energy dispersion. Now, can this be ever saturated? Are there uh, physical systems in which the uh, growth of the complexity saturates this bound? Yeah, so this is. The question we next ask and it, it's not obvious that this is possible because there should be very strong relations between the Liouvillian, the operator we have chosen to describe and the grid of complexity operator but it turns out that indeed uh, it can al always be saturated so let's see okay so this I'm just going to uh, say that um, uh, this is the, the question is can it be, can it be saturated yes it can how do we know it? Well, so there's a bit of group theory involved, but it's very simple. Essentially, we have seen that the Liouvillian can be thought as the sum of a raising and lowering operator. So we introduce as well the difference between this raising and lowering operator. Let's call it B. Um, so I'm here. And let's take a, a look at the commutator of the Liouvillian and this operator that we have just introduced, which is the difference between uh, the raising and lowering part of the Liouvillian. And if these three operators close an algebra, then uh, this, we saturate the dispersion bound. We saturate this bound. So let, let me provide a bit of intuition. Yeah? So we actually saw more. So we saw that there is only one way in which these operators can close an algebra. So this is the algebra that uh, has to be satisfied. It does include some con constants. Importantly, it includes the constant alpha that governs the growth of the Langchos coefficient in the uh, grid of lattice. And uh, it also relates the, this operator, which is the commutator for the Liouvillian, would be to the grid of complexity operator. No? You know, so, so, so this is all looks very algebraic, but you know, the important thing is that under these conditions, the dynamics is essentially that of a generalized coherent state. And we know that coherent states have minimum uncertainty. So you know, we can see how, uh, thanks to these algebraic properties, we have physics that resemble that of coherent states that you are familiar with, with the harmonic oscillator, and that's uh, how we have the intuition that we can saturate under these conditions uh, the, 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 the rate of complex, uh, grid of complexity growth. The proof we give in the paper is different, but you know, this is uh, part of the heuristics that uh, led us to the result. Now, the con uh, we can show, uh, you know, these are two much nicer equations. So if we want to have maximal growth of the grid of complexity, there's only one way in which the grid of complexity operate, uh, the Langchos coefficients can grow. And you know, so it completely uh, stating that the growth of, of the complexity should be maximal, completely fixes the dependence of the Langchos coefficients on the grid of lattice index. Yeah? So it has to be of this form, perfect. And 
nicer than that is that the imposes that the cradle of complexity should be uh, should observe should fulfill this simple harmonic oscillator equation. You know, so uh, the only conditions for in which the cradle of complexity can grow saturating the speed limit is essentially when it evolves in this uh, second order differential equation, and it does have three uh, different uh, regimes. In one of them, it oscillates periodically in time. In another, it can grow exponentially. So this is essentially what you will expect in quantum chaos. And in another, it grows parabolically. Yeah? And this is associated with different symmetries in the, in the Liouvillian, in the dynamics. Uh, let's make it with plots. It's always nicer to look at a plot. So you know, these are the po three possible scenarios in, that lead to saturation of the uh, complexity growth rate uh, as a function of time. And uh, what is perhaps, you know, so we, this is uh, completely, there's a complete relation between how the Langshaw's coefficients uh, vary as, uh, along the grid of lattice, where they do something like a parabola or something that, that it is almost linear, and the tiny, time dependence of the grid of complexity, where it oscillates periodically or, you know, it grows exponentially. So this is a, a logarithmic scale. This is just a linear scale. Right. So, okay. So we now have this general understanding in which we can uh, see what are the conditions to saturate the grid of complexity growth. Uh, what we can do is to test whether uh, standard models of chaos, like uh, random metric Hamiltonians, saturate uh, this bound. Yeah. And actually, so we we numerically simulate or describe in the grid of lattice uh, some random matrices, and we find a very different behavior of the Langshaw's coefficients as a function of the uh, lattice index, nothing comparable to the uh, previous three, three cases. You can see here, uh, so that will be the figure in the, in the right. And when you do it for random matrices, a paradigm of quantum chaos, you see a very different behavior. Uh, we can see how the operator spreads in the grid of lattice. So this is the lattice index as a function of time, so it's growing. And um, we can compute the grid of complexity and its rate specifically. Yeah? So surely enough, the grid of complexity grows and eventually st starts to saturate. And if we look at the rate, what we find is that uh, in early stages of the dynamics, the growth is indeed maximal. So over here, we have saturation of the bound. Uh, but then there is a characteristic time scale at which the uh, uh, growth rate slows down and uh, no lo is no longer maximal, even for a quantum chaotic model. We can identify uh, this characteristic time scale where the, uh, essentially the grid of complexity starts to become slower and it is universal. You can compute it with a, a funny expression in terms of the first few Langshaw's coefficients, uh, but you know it, it always exists and we just find it by imposing that the Langshaw's coefficients cannot fulfill the condition for maximal growth. So it's just a simple identity. But this is the, the, essentially the, the main uh, result, so I'm just going to close with a summary. Uh, we were motivated by this uh, hypothesis for operator growth that suggested that grid of complexity can grow at most exponentially, and it does so for chaotic systems. So we went ahead and we have introduced a rigorous bound for the complexity growth and so that it is only saturated uh, if uh, some algebraic relations are fulfilled, which correspond to three different dynamical symmetries, so SU2, SL2R, and heisenberg bite and only one of them gives rise to exponential growth of the grid of complexity. Now, importantly, quantum chaos is not required at all to have maximal growth of complexity, and actually, paradigms of quantum chaos also do not satisfy or do not fulfill maximal growth. You have some quantum chaotic systems that do, some that don't. Yeah? Uh, and then you have to refine the notion of chaos. In particular, you may call fast scramblers those systems in which you have effectively linear growth of the uh, Langshaw's coefficient. And for those, yes, you do have a maximal growth of, of the field of complexity at all times. All right. So I guess yes, I just close with an outlook. Uh, we have introduced this dispersion bound, but we are thinking now in more general terms about uh, operator quantum speed limits. So we have our first paper in the archive that yeah, I think it was uh, one month ago or so that we put uh, over there. And we are also thinking of geometric understanding of these uh, speed limits and how to saturate them for other operators and other scenarios in the grid of space or just in operator space. And this, we, are, we are, have already seen that they have applications to transport coefficients, quantum metrology, a renormalization group, that's something we are still looking at, uh, Bergner flows and you know, other, other systems. So 
I guess with this, I, I close. So I thank you all for your attention.